Good evening. My name is Brad Forder. I'm director of programming for the Environmental Film Festival in the nation's capital. Welcome to the festival's closing program featuring the DC premiere and award screening of Sharkwater Extinction. This is a special night to celebrate the life and the work of Rob Stewart, and we're so honored to have his parents here tonight, Sandy and Brian, who produced the film. They will be joining us after the program for a discussion, along with Brock Cahill, founder of the Sea Change Agency, and moderated by Catherine Kohlberg. Catherine is Director of Marine and Wildlife Protection for the Humane Society of the United States. As this year's festival comes to a close, and on behalf of the staff, I just want to thank all of our volunteers and partners, as well as our filmmakers and participants as well. Thank you all for just an incredible 10 days. I also want to acknowledge all of the 2019 sponsors of the festival. First, a huge thank you to our presenting sponsor this year in Main Stage, National Geographic. It's been wonderful to be here throughout the festival. Also, I want to thank our lead sponsors, the Wallace Genetic Foundation, the Shared Earth Foundation, Farview Foundation, as well as the Boatwright <laughs> Foundation, and the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities. So in addition to being the closing film of the 2019 festival, Sharkwater Extinction is also the recipient of this year's Shared Earth Foundation Award for Advocacy. To present the award to Sandy and Brian, I'd like to introduce the president and CEO of the Shared Earth Foundation, also a member of the festival's board of directors. Please welcome Caroline Gable. Thank you, Brad, and I echo Brad's welcome to all of you, and thank you for coming. And yes, this is the last night. It's going to be a wonderful presentation. The Shared Earth Foundation believes it is our responsibility to share the Earth with our fellow co-equal creatures. We focus on endangered species, their habitats, the indigenous people who guard their habitat, and now the filmmakers who fight for them, risking their lives, and in this case, giving that last full measure to their chosen creatures. Rob's mission was to stare evil in the eye, film it, and share it on behalf of the majestic creatures he loved, who cannot speak their own agony. It is therefore, with awe and humility, for the beauty of filming, the, maj the majesty of and threats to sharks and the other large sea creatures, we present this Shared Earth Foundation Award for Advocacy to Shark Water Extinction with special remembrance of Rob Stewart, the brave maker of this exceptional film. Welcome, Brian and, Sam and Sandy. Thank you, Caroline, and thank you so much to Chris and Brad and the DC Environmental Film Fest for presenting Rob's film tonight and for honoring Rob with this award. Rob would have been so proud to have been here accepting. He made shark water because he wanted the world to see the beauty of the underwater creatures, and once they realized that, they would work to protect them and to show a bit of the issues with the sharks. Uh, so that when they were out in the world, they could make better choices. When he made Revolution, it was, uh, he cast a wider net. Uh, it was about ocean acidification, and uh, it was the first feature film that actually platformed that. We weren't just going to lose some polar caps and some polar bears. We were at risk of losing all of the coral reefs and 25% of the fish uh, and possibly the oceans themselves. 
with shark water extinction, he wanted as many people as possible to see this film. Uh, he, when he came to us, uh, you know, we said, you know, why shark water? Why do we have a follow up on that? You know, why not a follow up to revolution? And uh, he looked at us and he said, sharks don't have that much time. By the time we figure that out, they'll be gone. Uh, so thank you so much for everybody for coming today. And so many people in, in the audience that uh, worked with Rob over the years. Uh, he was a believer that uh, if we all came together, we could truly change the world. Thank you. I'd like to acknowledge a few people in the audience with us today. Uh, to Brock Cahill and Kerry will stand up, please. Brock is a uh, die buddy of Rob's and uh, has been with us for the journey of getting, presenting the film and has been taking us to or being with us at film festivals all over the world. And Carrie is our publicist who has been with Rob since his first movie and has basically helped usher us through to where we are today, taking the film around the world. So I want to say thank you to both of you. And I have a special call out to a couple individuals. Um, during the search for Rob, the Coast Guard stepped up and was absolutely extraordinary. And I have, I think in the audience, we have two that, basically the two guys that led that whole search. And C Captain Jeff Jansen, could you please stand up? And Clint Prindle. so much for the extraordinary job they did and uh, please enjoy the film and look forward to talking to you afterwards. Roll it! <laughs> what a powerful film. Rob is a true inspiration. Catherine Kohlberg. I'm the Director of Marine and Wildlife Protection at the Humane Society of the United States. My organization is thrilled to be supporting this beautiful film with its important message to protect sharks. Without further ado, I am honored to introduce Rob's parents and the producers of the film, Brian and Sandy Stewart. Brock Cahill, who is the founder of Sea Change Agency and cast member of Sharkwater Extinction. So thank you for being here. So Brian and Sandy, it's clear that the production of this beautiful film was a massive undertaking. Can you talk a bit about the editing process and what your biggest challenges were? Well, Right after the accident, uh, Brian and I just went into a state of shock. It uh, took some time to get uh, Rob back to Canada and do a funeral. And then after that, it was, you know, what are we going to do? Uh, we had an editor go through Rob's footage, and he actually shot 400 hours uh, for this film alone. He's got over 1,000 hours in his libraries through the years. Um, and we had somebody go through that footage. And this is 6K, by the way. Uh, so some of the footage is really spectacular. Uh, they went through the footage, and then we went back through the footage to say, okay, how much of Rob is in the footage? Because when you do a Rob film, he talks all the way through it, he narrates it. You know, he takes you, he never preaches, he takes you on a journey. And as you're going through that journey with him, you find out, you know, what he believes, and uh, you can make your own decisions from that. But we found it, and we found a spectacular editor in Canada, Nick Hector who weeded through those 400 hours and actually put the story together. And Yeah, I mean, the biggest issue we had was Rob was very meticulous. He knew all the science behind what he was trying to explain, and he studied it all, and he knew everything he wanted to do. And one of the things we had trouble with, we, first of all, we had to break into his computer, and uh, <laughs> we got his, his password was gratitude, which, if you know Rob, says oodles about who he was as a human being. Um, but his iPad was locked, and according to Apple, there's no way we could ever break into it. It was done, and we found a way to clone it. it probably is not legal or something, but we found a way to get into it. And that was the jam, because in that iPad 
We're all in sketches. He had the, the iPad pencil. He sketched every scene that he wanted to shoot. He had notes on every location he was going to. He had story arcs for every location he was going to. So we used those notes as the guide to make the film. And that, plus the footage, gave Nick Hector the ability to pull together over a period of about eight months the first cut. And we saw the first cut in December of 2017. Of 10 months after the accident, and uh, we knew when we saw it, it was really tough tough to see it, um, tough to watch, but when we saw it, we knew we had a film. And then we brought in Stuart Gunnison, who is an award-winning director who came as a creative consultant, and he helped tighten up the story and move some things around and worked with Nick on a pretty regular basis, and that's what we have today. This movie was a labor of love for a whole bunch of people and a whole bunch of people that banded together. You know, the cinematographers and the team that all came together to actually make sure we finished the film was was amazing. The best cinematographers in the world stepped up and said, whatever you need, we're there. And people from all over the world reached out to try to help us. So we knew we had to finish the movie. There was no choice. Uh, it was something that we had to do for Rob. Thank you. Now that we've all watched the film and been so moved by it, what are some easy things that people can do to carry on Rob's legacy to protect sharks? It's probably a whole bunch of suggestions, but uh, don't eat shark fin soup. Um, be an educated consumer. Look for shark products, you know, in your consumer goods. In cosmetics, um, uh, shark oil is called squalene, but so is vegetable squalene, which is made out of olive oil. Uh, so if you don't know if it's a vegetable product and it's got squalene in it, uh, just simply don't buy it. Be an educated consumer. Yeah, be an educated consumer. So if you're feeding your cat wet cat food you know, in a can, and it's any fish product on the side, if it says white fish, pretty good chance it's shark. Um, it's, shark is, is labeled about 18 or 19 other names, none of which have the word shark in it. So you gotta be very careful. So give it chicken. <laughs> if, if chickens go down, we don't go with it. If the oceans go down, we all go with it. So we don't want that. Brock, can you talk a bit about your relationship with Rob and how it spurred you to create the Sea Change Agency and what your organization does? Yeah, sure. Well, uh, I first met Robbie about, I guess it's 12 years ago or so. I saw him on the cover of a magazine, Freediving with Sharks. And like him, I grew up in a landlocked area, nowhere near the ocean, but completely intrigued by the ocean and its animals and especially sharks. So we shared that, and when I saw what he was doing, and this was just previous to his first film being released, Sharkwater, I was like, who is this guy? And what's he doing? And he's free diving in a Speedo with sharks? I mean, this is wild. <laughs> so I was moved immediately to reach out to him, and I actually called him out of the blue, and I was like, hey, dude, uh, I don't know if you, know, you need any help or anything, but I sure would like to be friends with you. <laughs> and he was like, dude, let's be bros. It'll be fantastic. <laughs> who are you, and what do you do? <laughs> And I teach yoga in Los Angeles, and I said, well, I'm going on a yoga retreat next week to go free diving with sharks in Mexico. You want to come? And his answer was, hell yes. Let's go. And we became friends from that moment on, and we, uh, we swam all over this beautiful blue planet, and we had a chance to meet some of the most charismatic shark species around, and, and it became a friendship that, that meant the world to me. And, and his mentorship, if you will, is what spurred our agency into activation. And Rob is a co-founder of the Sea Change Agency and he had his own nonprofit organization called United Conservationists that did so much good work the world over. Um, but through our community, he, he really activated all of us by lighting a fire, forgive my French, but underneath our ass to make sure that we stood up for what was going on in the oceans. And before him, there was nobody that had really illuminated this problem in the way that he did, and, and inspired a whole new group, a whole new army of people to get involved and to think that they could make a difference. Because look at this young fellow. He stepped forward all on his own at 22 years old and changed the world completely. That to me was enough inspiration and motivation to go ahead and do something about it as well. Thank you. I wanted to be sure to mention um, that although the act of shark finning is illegal in US waters, so taking the fins off a live shark and dumping the body overboard to slowly die. The trade in shark fins is still legal in most states. So the US still participates in the global trade of shark fins. 
But there's good news. There is a federal bill right now in Congress, H.R. 737, the Shark Fin Sales Elimination Act, which is pending, that, that would uh, it, prohibit the import, export, possession, trade, and distribution of shark fins in the U.S. Very exciting. And it would take the U.S. out of the destructive global shark fin trade. So the Senate version will be introduced shortly. So call your members of Congress. This is something everyone in this room can do and urge their support and co-sponsorship of this important piece of legislation. With that, I'm going to open it up to questions for the audience. So please just raise your hand and there's some mic runners around. Yes. Hi, great, quick, great film. Uh, real quick question. There was a, just a brief allusion to the importance to uh, uh, apex predator, predators. And it was a very brief mention about, um, obviously, you know, it has you know, reverberations down the food chain. Uh, but one of the things that was mentioned was the uh, oxygen being generated by the plankton. That was just, without getting too elaborate and going on, I was just wondering if you could just elaborate just a little bit more on that important uh, connection. Yeah, so that, that's a really important point that is uh, begging to be made in this film and elsewhere in the world. And basically it's called a trophic cascade. When you have an apex level predator, it's, it's controlling the ecosystem and all the, the subspecies underneath it, right? So um, there was a great example of this on the internet recently. I don't know if you saw it, it was called the Wolves of Yellowstone, right? And it's how the wolves controlled everything within that ecosystem to the meandering course of the rivers. The sharks are very similar in the ocean and on the coral reefs in that, that as they control everything that subsists below them, you know, they keep it in balance. I, I like to call them the architects of the sea or even the custodians of the ocean because they clean up all the stuff that needs to be cleaned up in order for, in order for the other parts of the ecosystem to thrive. And as you talk about plankton and, and the coral reef systems, we all need them desperately for the rest of the species on this planet to survive. This is one of the most important issues of our time. Every other breath you take is generated by the ocean. So without sharks maintaining this ecosystem and this balance, we're all in a world of hurt. And all species on this planet are in, in, at a tremendous risk. Another question from the audience? Yes, over here. Uh, I was wondering, you were talking about the shark fin trade. What about the trade in shark meat? And also, if you could mention um, I know there's growing aquaculture, salmon, other species. How is that impacting the survival of sharks? Well, we have salmon that are being farmed now or now eating shark in the form of shark pellets. Fish farms all over the world are now feeding shark to the fish. To shrimp? Yeah, to shrimp. Um, chickens are eating shark. Pigs are eating shark. This is totally rot. We've got it all ass backwards. We got to change this. So you talk about shark meat. I mean, shark meat right now is being consumed without you knowing it in restaurants all across the United States and around the world. Fish and chips, in most cases, is shark. They just had a study in the UK recently where the majority of fish and chip stores in the UK are now serving shark for fish and chips. The main value in a shark is still in those fins. Yeah. And if we could shut down the fin trade, um, most of the fishermen out there would not bother with the rest of the shark. They wouldn't. Uh, there wouldn't be enough of a market for them to make that worthwhile. Uh, with the exception of the deep sea sharks, uh, and that's the ones that they use for uh, squalling in the shark liver oil, about 60% of their body weight is the liver. And, uh, you know, they're fishing these beautiful animals to extinction before anybody's actually even researched them. They're so deep. Yeah, and these guys bring up another good point, and it's due in... in part to your question, and it's mislabeling, which is a huge hot topic here in the States and worldwide. We just recently uh, were privy to uh, research done up in Canada that 48% of all fish that went to market was mislabeled. So you have a one in two chance of getting what you think you're actually buying. So this is something that we as consumers need to step forward and make sure that we insist that people are being more honest and straightforward with what's coming to market. Your dollars speak, and I think that's a big message that Rob tried to get across. You vote with your dollars every day based upon the choices you make. Make better choices, we're going to make a better world. But Rob would want everybody to be 
Uh, not to be sad, he really believed and he was an eternal optimist that uh, together we could change the world. Another question? Yes. One question I, I have that I don't hear very much about are prosecutions. Um, are you aware of anywhere that these folks who are engaging in the illegal trade are being brought to the mat, if there's any success in that, whether it's RICO's or their equivalent of anything in that nature? The only place law. where we actually see real action taking place is in Indonesia. The environment minister in Indonesia has decided that she's got to basically has, a, has it out for the shark fin trade in Indonesia, and she's actually sunk about 300 boats over the last three or four years. But, the, but they're setting an example. So uh, if you get caught. Well, the U.S. recently, it was sometime in the last, what, 48 weeks, uh, they had a whole shipment of shark fins. Uh, in the Keys. Wasn't the Keys? Hawaii. Uh, Hawaii. Hawaii. Thought, yeah, being shipped over to Asia. Uh, they recognized what it was, and uh, those people have been arrested. Yeah, we're making inroads. Um, but the hardest thing is that beyond the territorial limits of any country, it's a little bit of the Wild West. So we don't have governing bodies. We, we need that. The United Nations has to come up with a solution. Or the consumer, which is all of us, has to be the answer. Stop buying product. Be careful what you're buying. And tell your friends exactly the same thing. Because nobody's going to do this but us. Enforcement is the toughest part of this entire thing. I think Abraham Lincoln famously said, like, a law without enforcement is just good advice. So, you know, it's, it's up to us and we're going to find ways to make sure that we put pressure on our agencies to make these kind of enforcement things available. Over there. Hi. Okay. Um, so he used words, Rob used words in the film to describe sharks like cheeky and dopey. Mm -hmm. um, which is in a huge contrast, I think, to a lot of the words and adjectives that we hear surrounding sharks. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak about like what role you think changing the language surrounding shark education and wildlife education in general plays in educating kids and youth on why it's important to care about them. I think one of Rob's biggest legacies um, is teaching people that sharks just aren't as dangerous as they're made out to be in Jaws. But you're right, we have to change the language, you know, about how people describe these. You know, you see Rob describing it, it's totally different than, you know, you would see it described in a movie like Jaws. Yeah, the iconic shot of him hugging the shark and petting it. From the first movie, it's appeared in media all around the world, and it's probably one of the first times people realized He's petting like it's, a, like it's a, a golden lab or something. I mean, come on, this is really insane. Yeah. And that really has changed people's perception. How can someone be petting a shark like it's a puppy? Well, the reality is they are. These are creatures that are just so misunderstood. It's called the Jaws effect. And Rob talked about the Jaws effect all over the world and how, you know, Jaws gave everybody a perception. People were afraid to go in swimming pools after reading Jaws. I mean, uh -huh. it was just insane. People's perception has got to change. And this is what Rob was on the on their road to do. I think he really did get it started in a large way. I mean, there's now a tremendous amount of, you can see all over social media, people swimming with sharks and, and getting involved in conservation of sharks and, and the perceptions are changing. And it's due large in part to this young man here. You know, he was one of the first people that recognized, well, if, if these sharks have a PR problem, we need a better, you know, kind of representative. Maybe he could step forward and, and give them a little bit better reputation. And as we started to figure out that these are sophisticated and sensitive animals, and that they can communicate with you and you can communicate back with them, and that it's a very interesting exchange of energy. And once you see this happen underwater, you don't think that these are just mindless beasts with black eyes that are out to get you. So that was, uh, you know, our job in these films was to make sure that people got a chance to see that side of them. You know, one of the things that Rob used to talk about was uh, diving with great whites. And everybody said, "Why you never do a dive with great whites, do you? And said, yeah, well, that is the ultimate shark. And he, they'd be able to say, well, you're always in a cage. He said, well, you know, you're watching TV. People are in cages. The person filming the person in the cage is out of the cage with the shark. <laughs> people don't, don't go like this and go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. So somebody's got to be filming it. Yeah, that was Rob. So, you know, he had no fear of sharks. Sharks are never going to get him.